Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 46 of Podcast vs. Enemies, a Destiny Massive Breakdown show. This week, we have our Spire of the Watcher special. I'm really excited to talk about this dungeon, its set of weapons mechanics. Uh, the weapon's a bit of a mixed bag, but we'll get into some detail on that later. Before we jump in, we want to take just a second to thank a few people. Court, how you doing? Not bad, Saints. Hope you guys are doing well. Another week closer to Lightfall. Uh, but yeah, this this week is all about the dungeon. And yes, we do have a few folk to thank this week. Uh, no reviews, no uh, direct feedback, uh, but we do have some patrons and sponsors to thank. Uh, for our new patrons, we've got Bumble Zane. And for our sponsors, we've got Binary Wolf, Black Hammer Tech, Bryce Orney, Askin Monk, Deacon, Starscreen S13, Moonlight, The Shazzle, This Moment, and Zenzo Cal. Uh, thank you very much. If you are uh, a new patron or you're looking to become a new patron, uh, make sure to join the Discord server, get your own fancy little uh, role, and access to some channels. Uh, reminder you can send us all kinds of feedback directly to any of our socials or via the Discord itself. Uh, positive, critical and constructive feedback helps with the trajectory of the podcast and how we present and break down builds, activities and much more in the PvE sandbox for both the established Destiny players and new lights. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out if you've got any questions or ideas for builds. We're all happy to talk Destiny. Uh, we also want to extend a special thanks and appreciation to everyone that support, supports PvE, whether that's downloading and listening to our show, uh, discussing it on this Discord server, or a f aforementioned patron supporting us through us there. Uh, Impetus, what are we talking about this week? We are covering a dungeon, the new dungeon this season, Spire of the Watcher. We're going to be doing an encounter breakdown, going over the loadouts, some tips and tricks for each of the three major encounters where the secret chests are, and of course, the loot that's dropping from it. We'll be doing a loot breakdown as well. Before both of those things, though, we are going to cover some pretty big highlights from the 112 TWAB. Uh, got some very exciting news for that. Very happy to get into that here in just a moment. Uh, we're going to go into our what did we do in and out of Destiny 2 last week. I'll start things off. Not a whole lot, but a little bit of progress made here. I did craft Tripwire Canary and the Epicurean, so that rounds out uh, crafted versions of the Seraph weapons. I still have the Ikelos shotgun that I need to craft, and then I'll have all of the seasonal weapons done. And then the Epicurean was dropping from the Duality Dungeon, that is the last weapon from Season of the Haunted that I needed crafted. So excited to wrap those things up. Uh, I just did my first master run of Spire of the Watcher last night with Court, and that allowed me to get the Hierarchy of Needs Catalyst, which is very nice. So I'll be leveling that up uh, probably starting right after we get done recording and working on that before the season ends. And of course, looking forward to GMs. Court, what did you do last week? Yes, was doing the uh, very... Interesting difficulty uh, that is Master Spire with yourself uh, and Fate On as well. Shout out! Uh, but yeah, uh, maybe something we'll talk about at the end of the season or as a sort of roundup. But uh, very questionable difficulty rating for the, the, the Master version. It's not something that I think we'll be uh, uh, farming for uh, Artifice Armor. I think we'll keep that to uh, Keitel and uh, Grasp of Avarice. Um, for me personally, for other things, I've been working towards my bequest and posterity. I've got two more for the sword and one more for the hand cannon uh, red borders to get. Uh, and I'll have those crafted and ready to rank up for Lightfall. Perhaps some interesting heavy meta change as we've been uh hearing there's some teasing in the backgrounds maybe a sword a return to the sword meta especially with bequest <laughs> uh outside of that just farming some duality spire uh, and played with some patrons on some raids and pvp uh saint where have you been up to yeah a few deep sand runs you know trying to get some red borders um i crafted posterity that i think that was my first one right so i've actually been enjoying that slightly, which is saying a lot, you know, for the 180 family. Uh, still haven't crafted the Epicurean Impetus. Yeah, I think that's been sitting at three out of five for uh, for a while now. But, you know, maybe we'll get there someday. <laughs> uh, 
uh this past week i i did a petra's run um with some buds my, my buddy professor finally got his ribbon spain title uh and that was always you know i mean that that heart walk is like always just an absolute thrill no matter how many times you, you've been through that or done a flawless raid or anything like that so uh good times all around it took us a few attempts um at one point when we were doing a jumping you know just traversal section uh somebody fell to their death and it didn't pull us to orbit, which was super weird. And for just a second, we thought that we had failed to do the wish, despite it, like, showing up in the feed. Uh, so we decided to just go ahead and jump off the cliff immediately again, and then it pulled us to orbit. So some fun times, but uh, got that done in the end. Um, you know, upgrade and revision zero. Uh, yeah, and just trying to get my power level up uh, for going in for some Master Val challenges uh, whenever that finally comes back around. And uh, GMs, which are coming up. But uh, I may not be so concerned about grinding my level for GMs uh, here pretty soon because of some changes that we're going to talk about in just a second. Um, so let's jump into the TWAB, and they kind of just came out swinging with like a Wednesday update on this one, which was which was wild. I didn't uh, expect to see this, but armor mods. All standard armor mods in the game, excluding raid and those that are available on the artifact have been unlocked for everybody. Uh, charged with light, elemental cells, war mines. If you have been missing some kind of a mod, you couldn't get elemental charge or lucent blade or something like this, and you've been after it for a long time, this is the time. This is the time to go in uh, and just capitalize on builds. Um, Bungie said that they are also going to be putting out a blog post uh, the same week that this episode goes out with some more information on build crafting and how it's going to be involving in Lightfall. Definitely expect to hear us uh, discussing covering this a lot in our next episode, episode 47. Uh, next up is a really nice change, maybe not quite as impactful for some people, but uh, the cost for focusing is going down. So Trials, Iron Band, or Crucible, Gambit, uh, you know, weapon armor focusing is all being reduced down from uh, to, to 25 Legendary Shards from 50. Um, as a reminder, next season in Lightfall, the Vanguard is also going to be getting this feature uh, similar to all the aforementioned playlists and things like that. Um, Adept weapons have been reduced down to 50 from 250, <sighs> and the Glimmer cost for focusing regular weapons is down to 5k from 10k. Uh, I can't tell you guys how many thousands of legendary shards I spent trying to get an, a perfect adept reads the weekend I grinded out trials. Uh, absolutely brutal. Cleared me out, man. Uh, and lastly, I think the biggest one that we'll probably talk about for just a second here is uh, the changes to Grand Masters. So GMs this season are on the 17th, just a few days away now. Bungie has announced that they are also making some changes to GM power cap structure to make it just a little bit more approachable to players while still maintaining its challenge. So decrease power level to enter Grandmasters by 25 to 1580, just powerful cap. Decrease the overall power level of Grandmasters by 10 to 1620, but kept the current power level difference of 25 points. So the, the 25 point delta between you and enemies is still present. So the feeling of uh, the GM, so to say, should be exactly the same um, unless you are severely under light. So you can enter a, a GM at 1580, but you're going to be uh, at a 40 level delta. And then you can, you know, use your artifact power and everything to get up to 1595. Um, which, you know, as opposed to, uh, it would be 1605, right, is what you would have to be, you know, for reference on, like, what it typically would be. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Kind of a smacking twab for just something coming out a little bit before season model updates. Uh, Impetus Court, you know, thoughts on our mods and, and GMs here. Well, my biggest reaction uh, when I first read this was to do with the armor mods and that yep. was that was my immediate reaction was yes finally like us as a podcast we recommend uh, uh builds uh, and loadouts for all three classes mm -hmm. but sometimes we had to kind of skirt around that particular subject because not everyone has access to 
elemental well mods or charge plate mods so that's like fantastic and now like we can all go like full blast on all uh like build crafting the second thing was to do with grandmasters which is great uh, because as we've talked about in this podcast many times on and off uh the the the, the fatigue that's been setting in especially for me having to grind all the way up to plus 15 on the artifact and reach pinnacle just to access gms which is one of my favorite activities was just really starting to grind me down uh, so this is a welcome change but the big like finally for me the big like question mark or exclamation mark has to do with the more information on further changes to gms and other high difficulty modes coming soon now is that a prelude to what we've been already what we've been seeing where we are capped uh like the legendary mode for the campaign uh for witch queen uh, uh witch queen or for the heist battleground modes is it going to be similar to something like that because if it is thumbs up two thumbs up <laughs> um yeah like I'm, I'm looking forward to uh that particular news but it's been uh, a great introduction to 2023 for for quality of life changes for destiny too yeah absolutely um i mean we, we said during our our first community interview that you know the one thing that i would personally change would unlock all the armor mods for every everybody so that the new players could jump right in and it's finally here so we're good we're we're chilling now uh grandmasters are more approachable you know they're still challenging right i think that was a smart move to keep the current power difference uh it's it's it hasn't gotten any easier it's just gotten more approachable and that's that's a great distinction to make i think that's really really a smart part on uh bungie's behalf to do that so yeah go go in there i know we don't have a lot of time to do the grandmasters uh, it's definitely a shorter season but uh, hopefully most of you that have been playing the season actively should be in an, an approachable state in terms of your power level for the gms when they do show up on the 17th so great changes all around um yeah, I do just want to say one thing about the armor mods. If you had ones that were not unlocked yet, they don't show up as unlocked in your collections. But if you do go to your individual armor pieces, you'll see them all show up there. So don't freak out if your collection still says that you have missing mods. They are unlocked for you. You just need to see them in your armor menu specifically. Uh, Bungie did say that they would, I think, try to address the the collections issue at some point in the future, mm. or at least that they're aware about that, but you have them all. They, they are there. I promise. So great, great change. Awesome. Loved getting that in the middle of the week. Definitely a huge pick me up for all kinds of players. Um, one thing I did want to add is, okay, so like you can go in at negative 40 now, right? But just to kind of like set people's expectations on that. Um, I don't. I, I'm. I'm. Uh, this is off the top of my head, so I'm not sure if this is exactly right. But I, I remember looking at some power delta calculations and thinking that the, or, or remembering that the incoming damage at like a negative twenty five is around two hundred ish percent, right? So <laughs> about double, and and your damage dealing is at like seventy ish percent outgoing. So yeah, I like think you're, you're right. So at negative forty, I mean we're we are pushing like triple incoming damage, and you're dealing like uh, maybe forty to thirty percent outgoing damage. So you're really gonna need some 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 grit or some high level teammates. All right, one or the other is is what it's gonna take to get you through. Um, but yeah, interesting that they're they're willing to kind of like give people the opportunity, right? To uh. I, uh, to to mess around and find out uh, to say it in a PG way you know? <laughs> <laughs> to handicap themselves. Yeah, I'm glad that they're you know they're looking out for people like Esoteric now that now that they'll have mm -hmm. some more videos to make where they do all the GMs at 40 power below and you know so oh yeah that's, so true. that's like a whole new thing of content yeah right oh, that's yeah. so considerate yeah. for Bungie yeah. looking out for these high level GM players. I'm saying that facetiously. Yeah, that's uh, it, it. Really is a good change though. I think you know RNG is the pinnacle stuff is all RNG, so it's. It is definitely frustrating when I'm waiting on one class item for my my Titan. I think my highest um, class item is uh, like 85 or maybe 84 right now. I just not have been lucky with my my pinnacle drops and my priming grams, so that's been really frustrating. But everything else, I'm you know I'm sitting great, so this will be nice to give me a little bit of flexibility uh, with my drops for all future seasons. So yeah, I mean can't 
can't hype this up enough. This, these are great changes. Great changes. All right, well, if you guys don't have anything else to add, I think we'll hop into Spire of the Watcher, our new dungeon for this season. This is our, our Vex dungeon set on Mars. Very, very fun. Very uh, mechanically straightforward. Not not quite as uh, daunting as duality was, but still a, a definitely good time. I, I think this is quite a fun dungeon, speaking for myself here. I'm going to start things off with our activity overview, kind of what to expect here, set the stage for you guys. So there are champions only on the master difficulty. This does have our, our normal difficulty and then a master difficulty for this dungeon. So we are dealing with overload minotaurs on master difficulty of Spire of the Watcher. There are no champions in the normal version here. So for this season, our overload options are auto rifles and SMGs. We also have scout rifle and then void and stasis grenades, stun overload champions. In this dungeon, the overload champions are replacing all of the conduit minotaurs. We'll talk about what those are as an enemy type in just a moment here, but that is what you can expect when you go into these encounters. If you know where the conduit minotaurs spawn in, those will all be overload champions. In terms of our shields, we have arc and or void. Uh, our harpies have arc shields and the minotaurs have void. If you are on the master difficulty, you will only have the harpies with arc shields as all the minotaurs are replaced with the overloads and they do not have elemental shields. So uh, if you are going into the master difficulty, strongly recommend playing on arc. Um, we'll talk about that in just a moment as to why. Uh, in terms of activity modifiers, there are none on the normal difficulty, and then the master mode does have the match game modifier. Another reason to be on arc. For our noteworthy and special enemies, we do have supplicants. Those are the exploding harpies. Those do not have shields. They're quite quick. Uh, this dungeon does feature some pretty tight or constrained spaces, especially in the final Final encounter, um, these can spawn in and catch you off guard, so you definitely do want to be aware of that. The supplicants do have a beeping that they make, and that beeping will increase in frequency as they get closer to you, so definitely keep your ears open, but also look at your mini-map to see if there are any enemies around you because you do not want to be surrounded by supplicants. The other major noteworthy enemy here are the Conduit Minotaurs. These are Void Minotaurs with a special mechanic tied to them that we will go over in just a sec. Uh, they are elites, but of course in Master Difficulty when they become Overload Champions, they are mini-bosses. So that means that they are both affected by Major Spec on either difficulty. Um, if you are going in on Master against the Overloads, you could also use Forpal Weapon as a weapon perk against them for extra effectiveness, just something to be aware of. So Major Specs is going to be great there, and then Forpal Weapon will be nice on Master for the Overload Champions. We do have Cyclops in the starting area only. Um, you can choose to ignore them if you want or try and deal with them. That is up to you. Uh, you can use boss spec as a mod and then vorpal weapon as a perk to deal with them but they are only in the starting area they're not too big of a threat throughout the entire dungeon in all encounters and in some of the spaces between the encounters we do have hydras these have the floating shields they can be very annoying to deal with these are um, elites so you can use major spec for them uh, vorpal weapon as a perk as well Sometimes you can ignore them, sometimes you will have to deal with them and kill them. Um, we'll talk about the specifics as we go through each of the encounters here, but just to be aware, they are spread out throughout the entire dungeon here. The last thing I'll touch on before we go over to our recommended mods, we do have a lot of arc environmental energy, I guess is the best way to say that, uh, other than just electricity. It's arc damage. Um, you will kind of recognize it. It's the lightning beams kind of zapping between various structures or frames here. Uh, they do deal damage. Um, I have died almost instantly every time I've come into contact with them. I don't know if you can survive, so my advice to you is just to treat it as an instant death when you do see the lightning. You, oftentimes there will be a doorway with electricity kind of moving from the bottom slowly towards the top. So you kind of have to time when you walk through the doorway to avoid the electricity. That's the most common uh, thing you can use here. There's a lot of arc energy going on here in this dungeon. So uh, just be aware of that. But uh, you can't out resist this kind of environment energy. So do be aware of that. Don't die. Try not to uh, get zapped. Do the zapping, don't get zapped. Uh, 
All right, on to our recommended mods here. Uh, we're gonna start with our artifact mods. There's actually a lot of stuff in this season's artifact that will really come into play here. Uh, most of it probably will be more effective on the master difficulty. So I'll go over a few highlights here. Lord Kelvin's Basilisk, that is the Void and Stasis Grenades cause disruption and stun overload champions. That's your Void and Stasis option that I mentioned earlier. We also have Advanced Scout. So champions you stun do take additional damage from teammates. That is going to be very useful for the overload minotaurs, as there can be quite a lot of them. We do also have a Lucid Finisher making a return this season, so that is finishing a Hive Light Bearer, or in this case, a Champion will spawn heavy ammo for yourself and your allies. Again, you're not going to have a whole lot of opportunities to proc this on the normal difficulty of the dungeon, but with all of the Conduit Minotaurs turning into Champions on Master Mode, you can spawn a pretty near infinite supply of heavy ammo for your fire team. so we definitely, definitely recommend having Definitely one, at least two, if you really want to give yourself as many opportunities as possible if you're going into the master for either a single clear or if you're trying to farm run loose and finisher, it will make your life a lot easier. We do have weakened clear as well. That's damaging a boss champion or breaking a combatant shield with a grenade launcher. It does reload your stowed weapons and weakens that combatant very strong against the bosses for the damage phases as well as dealing with the champions. We also have Energy Diffusion Substrate. This is the um, special resistance mod that goes in your chest piece for this season. So that's gaining a small amount of damage resistance from combatants, and it does stack with other copies of itself. That is 5% damage resistance per mod, and that will cap out at 15% for three times. Do know that you'll need to have Artifice Chest Armor to get to that three times. And wasn't this uh, wasn't that bugged out for a while at the beginning of the season? It was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, did they fix most, that? I, yeah, most recent hotfix. Uh, that was patch. the most recent one. Yeah. Yep. Oh, nice, nice. It's, it's well, doing man, the intended look at me. Now. I'm still running one copy over here. Of like a brother, fool, dude. Come on, yeah. dude. Got to get that artifice chest armor, buddy. One used to do five, and then two and three did zero. <laughs> nice. There we go. Well, they did say a small right. amount, so they weren't lying. But yes, now it does finally stack with other copies of itself. Five percent per mod there, so definitely recommend that very helpful here. I do want to give a shout out to a few other options. We do have, of course, Overload SMG. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, if you are going into the master mode, but also this could apply on normal mode, you could put on Monochromatic Maestro. Dealing damage with the elemental abilities grants increased damage to weapons matching that element. I think, uh, you know, just off the top of my head here, the elements that make the most amount of sense for this mod would probably be Void or Arc. Uh, Arc definitely on the Master difficulty here, but uh, if you do want to pop the Void Shields on normal difficulty, you could run a Void build as well. Um, this has a nice little synergy here. Dealing damage with your elemental weapons grants extra damage to abilities matching that element. That's why I picked the Void or Arc here, but you could make this work on the other elements if you really wanted to. Again, Stasis can also stun Overload Champions. Uh, Solar can be quite strong, especially for Warlocks in that final encounter if you want. But, you know, speaking broadly for all of the encounters, I think uh, Arc or Void are probably going to be the best options if you want to go down this route here. Another one that I do want to bring up here, if you do have a Charged with Light build that you want to take into the dungeon, we do have Counter Charge. That will give you a stack of Charged with Light whenever you or a fire team member stuns a champion. This will be proccing pretty much all the time in the Master Mode, especially in the final encounter. So... If you do want to get easy stacks of Charge with Light to save some space on your armor piece, definitely put on Counter Charge. That would be quite strong in this activity, especially, uh, well, actually only on the Master difficulty. So those are our recommended mods here. I'm going to pass you off to Court to get into the mechanics for Spire of the Watcher. Yeah, so this is going to be a sort of brief overview of all the things you're going to be coming across, all the things that you'll be interacting as expected throughout the uh, uh, this dungeon. Uh, so the, the whole theme of this dungeon is all about uh, power management. Uh, you'll have power nodes, cables, and electrical buffs uh, to manage and maintain in various ways. Uh, so first up is the all-important Arctrician buff. So when you kill a Conduit Minotaur or an Overload Minotaur in Master version, uh, it will spawn a pool of Arc fluid around its uh, dead body. Uh, so standing in this pool provides players the Arctrician buff for 30 seconds, and this is refreshable. Uh, the, the actual um, uh, in-world uh, Arc fluid doesn't last too long. I think it's about 15 seconds, uh, but you, you effectively can have up to, uh, uh, you know, 
almost a minute's worth uh, of the art uh, And so, what, what does the art buff buff uh, do for you? It allows you to shoot power, power nodes. Uh, you'll see this buff in all encounters, uh, and uh, even between encounters as well, you'll be interacting with this particular buff. Uh, so power nodes, uh, when you have the art buff, uh, then you will find the starting power node. These usually, uh, well, no, these have arrows to signify it's the first one. Uh, and all you have to do is shoot it. Uh, once you've done that, follow the cable to the next power node and shoot it. A successful connection will light up the power cable connecting the two nodes. Uh, repeat this until you reach the end of the power node uh, circuit which will usually trigger an additional mechanic or result. Uh, we'll go into each individual case uh, for each uh, encounter uh, shortly here. Uh, power nodes can be above, below platforms, attached to walls, but below, you know, it can be in really tight areas of the map. Uh, so you will need to do a little bit of kind of heads down on the floor, trying to find out where it's, uh, where it's leading you. Uh, and, uh, especially when it comes to the side of the spire for encounter two, uh, that can be uh, for, for encounters one and two. It can be pretty, uh, uh, can be a bit confusing when uh, you've got uh, cables kind of linking between each other and overlapping with each other. Uh, so when you do shoot a power node, this extends the arctrish buff by five seconds, and again you'll be interacting this with all three encounters and in between the encounters. When we talk about power cables, these are the things that connect between two power nodes. Uh, so follow the cable between each power node. Uh, like, as I said, cables can intertwine with other cables and go over and under platforms. Kind of bamboozle you a little bit. Uh, kind of goes forward, then comes back on, on itself. Uh, unpowered power cables means that they have no electrical charge through the cable and they are coloured as yellow. Powered means that they have electrical charge present through the cable. Uh, these glow blue with a sort of arc VFX. Again, you'll be seeing all of these uh, uh, power cables throughout the three encounters and in between the encounters. Uh, lastly, we do have the trigger nodes. They're very similar to the power nodes, uh, but they are a little bit different uh, in the sense that these are individual cables that have one node each that all must be shot within a time frame. Again, you do require the Arctrician buff, shoot them. The order doesn't matter here, but it has to be done in quick succession. Uh, this will trigger a door, uh, a door opening or closing. Uh, and again, in terms of what unpowered and powered means, unpowered is red color and powered is that glow blue with arc VFX. Uh, you only see this before the boss room and the boss encounter as well. All right, so that's a brief overview of all the things that you'll be seeing and interacting with. Uh, Saint, what can you tell us about the starting encounter? We are we are putting all this stuff to use, and uh, it's it's uh, it's really setting in with our Western theme. We, we're we're rooting, we're tooting, we're conduit shooting. Okay, <laughs> this is basically your intro to all the the whole mechanic right of the dungeon, and it, and it gives you four branches. Uh, they go from the outsides in, and I mean, you know, basically you want to kill your Minotaur, you want to spread up or spread out and your team, uh, and they just start working kind of from the outer edges of the map in. Um, some tips for this one, uh, don't shoot the last power node in the sequence of like each branch. This is what actually triggers the supplicants to spawn in. Um, so if you hit everything but the final node in each line or like branch of nodes, and then you shoot all four, you know, within just a couple seconds of each other to complete them all at once, it will just finish up the first part of the encounter, the door will open, and you can move on. No supplicants will spawn at like any point throughout the whole thing, uh, which just makes it a little bit easier. It just speeds it up. It takes some of the risk and annoyance out of that opening encounter. Um, usually I'm using something like an SMG here to be able to just quickly spray around and hit my nodes, but you can also use something like a breach grenade launcher to hit nodes like around a corner, right? So like one of the nodes, it spawns kind of like downstairs in a basement. Uh, if you know where to shoot, you can like bank a shot off the wall and then hit the node or ones that are in rooms and things like that. You can bank, uh, shots for nodes. Um, and the last thing I'll say here is that after you've, you know, you've completed, uh, your opening moments here, um, 
biggest thing to watch out for is probably Cyclopses, like, beaming down at you. Uh, just take care of those guys right when you get into the arena. Um, and then, yeah, make sure you complete all your nodes at the same time. And when you're going down this ramp, um, you're, you're going to die if you don't do anything to prevent your own death. So you can jump. You can use the, the beams that are kind of on the sides as you go down to save yourself. Um, but you can also use, like, some movement abilities. Like, you can use uh, Icarus Dash and, like, our Titan Dash or, like, E-Reg Swords and things like that to kind of counteract the momentum that you're gaining as you go down the ramp. Um, so just some tips there, especially if you're trying to go for a flawless run on this dungeon. Uh, try to have some way in mind that you can easily control your momentum as you go down. There's no direct loot from this but if you've been through this dungeon at least once before you'll want to hit up a secret chest that is in the jumping puzzle right after you go through this section uh right when you get into the underground platforming section you'll see these three massive pillars over on the left side you'll kind of platform around through some hanging pieces and kill some hydras and other little low level ads and things like that um you'll end up kind of on the second pillar along the route you'll want to turn around and go all the way back to the very first pillar that's like on the far left and then on the back side of that pillar um you'll see a secret chest and there's also one of the like six five or six collectibles is on the way over there that you'll see so if you see a little blue screen with the fallen uh house of like devils logo on it right is the house of devils Anyways, i think it's salvation because nice. it's aramis yeah. oh yeah, yeah 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 that's right that's right thank you this um but yeah head back to that first pillar um and then kind of on the back side of the pillar you have your first secret chest which again you want to make sure that you're going through this on like your second run uh, and grabbing this because if you don't have any, if you've never had loot drop from the dungeon, the secret chest can't drop you any loot that you've never had on a reroll. So um, make sure that you actually don't grab this if you're going through this for the first time. That's about it for the opening. Uh, pretty easy, no direct loot, but you know, it kind of lines up with a lot of the other uh, earlier dungeon openings. Impetus, what can you tell us about our first actual encounter here? Yes, we are going to be climbing the spire. Pretty straightforward. Uh, I do love these kinds of missions in video games. Just anytime I see a tower, I want to climb it. So this whole dungeon's about climbing a big spire and then going down it. And that just activates my little monkey brain. So first encounter here, we are going to be going up three different uh, floors, I guess is the, the simplest way to explain it. Three different sections. Uh, we will be using the conduit minotaurs to activate a bunch of lifts that will take us up to the next floor here and then at the third floor at the very end after we've activated the lift or after we've shot the final final nodes uh, the chest will drop in here so not much of a strategy um, you will get up to that first floor there you're looking for the conduit minotaur on one of the side platforms you'll kill it get the buff and then you're just going to be following the cables to the nodes here uh, on both difficulties, you can ignore the goblins, and then there will be some hydras that spawn out in the air. As long as you're running high resilience here, um, I would just say the, the most difficult thing to be aware of, of course, are the holes and gaps in the floor as you're crawling around the outside of the tower here. And again, you need to remember that the nodes can be located below and above you on each floor. So the simplest way, the fastest way to do this, have all three players grab the Arctrician buff on each level, to ensure that every node is activated. Then you can split up, just follow the routes here. That third player can just pick between one of the two. Um, and just, you know, there's no need for one player to do ad clear here. If you really do need to, one single void grenade on any of the classes will probably mess up an entire ad wave. The platforms here are quite narrow, uh, even the ones where the enemies spawn in. So a well-placed grenade, especially an amped up grenade, if you got an, a grenade aspect on whatever subclass you're running, will take them out. And again, as for the Hydras, even on master difficulty, if you are spec'd into tier 10 resilience, you've got your 40% DR, you can avoid them. They they do hit hard. Um, I, I Again, you should be moving pretty quickly on the master mode. Presumably, you've already done this on normal already, so you should be familiar with the route. But on the normal difficulty of the dungeon, if you're going through this on the first time, don't worry too much about the hydras. Just memorize uh, the path for each of these nodes as you're going up. You'll get more familiar with this as you repeat it. This is probably the most farmable encounter in the entire dungeon. It can go quite quickly once you know where all the nodes are pathed up and uh, the floors do go quite quickly in a team of three so not much of a stressor here again recommended weapons we're, we're just trying to make sure that we can hit those nodes as quickly as possible here we're not really worried about 
a damage potential, but you can spec for damage again if you're on the master mode trying to deal with those hydras and champions. So for the nodes in particular, SMGs are a great recommendation. Trace rifles can also be really nice if you're just trying to do a spray and pray, uh, especially if you're doing this solo. Um, just making sure that you can get at least one of those bolts to uh, to land on that node to activate it can be quite nice here. But uh, yeah, iClose SMG is going to be a really great. Again, if you want to go for those sweet trick shots, you can use a grenade launcher. Pardonar Dust would be great. Any of the elemental ones is going to be quite strong as well. Xenophage as a heavy weapon can be very nice for that explosive area of effect. That That's another thing we should mention here. Uh, explosive payload perks is going to be quite useful for getting that extra tick of damage to go get close in the vicinity of any of those nodes there. So that's a good re recommendation here. Um, in terms of your abilities here, roaming supers can be quite nice for taking clear, taking care of the ad spawns if they are a problem for you guys. So on Hunter, you know, Silence and Squall is going to be quite strong here, locking down those ad waves as they spawn in. Uh, that's mostly for the goblins. I, you know, if you want to try and land a shot on a Hydra, you certainly can, but I think the goblins are probably going to be more annoying here. Uh, on Titan, definitely do Void uh, for the Overload Grenades if you're doing uh, Master Difficulty. You should probably be running Arc, though, on, on Normal just for the Storm Grenades. That will level out every single Goblin that dare spawn and interfere with you. So that's uh, definitely our recommendation for Titans. Uh, Warlocks, Vortex Grenades with Void. You know, we've got that grenade aspect. You can even spec in a Controverse Hold. That'll take care of everything. The sucking effect is just going to bring all those enemies into the center of the grenade and wipe them out. So don't worry too much about this. This is not really a, meant to be a challenging encounter. Just getting you familiar with going over the main mechanic kind of quickly, right? This is a mechanic that you can master once you've memorized the, the pathing locations. So this is the perfect time to practice that. You can definitely do this quite quickly. This is definitely a fun encounter to, to go fast on. So you're going to be climbing all the way up to the top of the tower after you get to that third floor. You've got one more, and then you're at the very top where you will do the Silence the Spire encounter. Saint, what can you tell us about this one? Yeah, this is our first, uh, you know, this is our first actual boss encounter, right? You are, you know, you're going to see pretty similar combatants here, right? We've got some uh, arc, we got harpies that are floating around. Some of these guys have arc shields, uh, same conduit minotaurs. And then we have Akelos, the Siren's Current. If you have ever played Garden of Salvation and you fought that Consecrated Mind, you are going to be uh, right at home, very familiar with what's going on here. Um, to summarize that, the actual DPS phase of this fight is pretty much the same as that boss from Garden, while the pre-DPS phase and the mechanics will be different. Um, so we have four kind of uh, branches of the power nodes that go out to these different extensions of the tower, right? There's four corners of a big walkways that go out to the edge, and each one of these will have a branch of nodes. You need to connect all the nodes this time, uh, rather than the opening encounter is kind of from the outside in. This time, it's all going from the inside out. So you're starting all the nodes in the middle, and they'll go out to the edge of the branches. Uh, you know, basic strategy, group up, kill that first minotaur, split to three of the separate branches everybody goes down clears out some ads completes all their nodes on that specific branch um and then you'll see uh some text in the feed right when you hit the node that is the very end of each one of those walkways it'll give you a little text in the feed um after everybody does their individual branch just squat up go down that final branch uh and then basically whenever you complete the final fuel rod on the final branch, the fourth branch, that is where the boss will be drawn to, and that is where your actual DPS phase is going to start. Um, you definitely want to be paying attention to the the harpies and, and little goblins that are floating around right before you go into DPS phase because, number one, they'll just be shooting at you, and it's real annoying, and you're taking extra damage. And number two... They can kind of like interfere with the boss and his pathing and your own pathing as you're trying to like deal damage. So uh, if you're running into goblins like while you're trying to go through this DPS phase, which is like pretty quick, pretty intensive, you don't want to be missing shots. So um, after you've gone around, you complete your individual branches, come together, clear out those last bit of ads and the harpies that are shooting at you. Uh, and then the boss will show up. And this is like where the actual, uh, you know, this kind of like goes into the garden mechanics of this of this massive harpy looking boss here you're going to want to use some kind of uh, rapid fire weapon ideally to start taking out the eyes that appear 
Um, the boss will show, I, I don't know, it's like 12 or 16 of these red eyes, and you need to damage them very quickly. Basically, the faster you clear his little eyes off of him, uh, the faster you're going to get to the DPS phase, which I believe leads to a slightly longer DPS phase. I'm not exactly sure if that's true, but more of the story is you want to get through these eyes as quickly as you can. Um, using a rally barricade here is really nice. We're getting some quick reloads. Um, using an SMG is kind of like a mixed bag because it's very easy to hit the nodes and to clear ads that are close to you, but like killing some of those heart pieces is really annoying. Um, I've, done, I've used a little like fate bringer and then in my energy slot, I'm actually using a Cartesian coordinate uh, because something like a rapid fire fusion with uh, Vorpal is really nice. You can just spray and take out like two or three of these eyes per burst. Uh, and with that, you know, half a second charge time, it's a really good tool for taking out those eyes super quickly. So you've summoned the boss, you've cleared off his various little eyes that have appeared. He shows his center eye, the big white eye, and this is like actually time for damage phase. The boss is going to immediately start pulling away from you back towards the center of the platform. So you you can try to stay stationary. It may be a little hard to hit him at times. You can try to kind of move forward along with him. But something you want to keep in mind here is, you know, if you activate a well of radiance at the beginning of the phase to help you clear out some ads and you're, you know, you're clearing off the boss's eyes, that's great, uh, you know, for your damage and survivability, but that buff isn't going to stick with you. So if you want to continue to have a buff as you're going, um, you know, something like Radiance, right, you can proc with a, you know, your melee, proc up some Radiance for your team is really good. Uh, Weapons of Light, obviously, is is very good if you happen to be, you know, especially if you're a Master, right, that's going to benefit you from running those Void Grenades, uh, and you could run Bubble as well on those Vortex Grenades. Um, but yeah, keep in mind that you're going to want to keep a buff on you as you kind of follow the boss back, or, or if nothing else, uh, working to make sure that you're going to be hitting your shots no matter where you're at. As soon as the health, or as soon as the damage phase starts, you're going to see his health bar kind of change into a couple segments. Uh, one of the segments that is going to be highlighted or shaded, you know, however you want to call it, depending on your your colorblind settings, may vary just a little bit. It's going to be about fifty percent of the boss's health. If you don't get through this entire bar, the boss is going to trigger a a this big pushback uh, mechanic whenever DPS phase ends. This can kill you outright if you're weak to other adds that are around you, or it can throw you off the map. Um, if you're able to deal enough damage, you can get a slightly longer DPS phase, and you can and you can avoid uh, some of the damage that you would have taken from this initial pushback. Um, but if you are not able to hit the threshold, fifty percent threshold, which is you know moderately high to, hard to do, you got to really be stacked up to 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 two phase or even one phase this boss. But you you know you got to be coming correct with your loadouts and buffs and debuffs. Um, but if you're not able to get him down, whenever you see the boss charging up, you're going to want to try to get out of his line of sight. Uh, you can drop down below the platform, behind a ledge, anything like that, um, jumping to a lower part or just falling in to the walkway that you've been standing on and getting out of line of sight will prevent you from taking damage from this attack. Um, so when we're talking weapons for this and supers, um, you know... Your Star Eaters Gathering Storm is just going to deal an obscene amount of damage. Uh, Golden Gun, you can run Tether if you if you want the highest debuff possible. Um, you know, Titans, like I said, you could run uh, Weapons of Light, uh, Ward of Dawn, and those Overload Grenades, if you, especially if you're on Master. Uh, Thunder Crash is good. I even spent a little bit of time on um, Solar, you know, procking that Monochromatic Maestro with Radiance is like a good combo. Uh, Warlock, I mean, well, is, is super, super nice for when you're in that early phase, when you're, when you're getting all the eyes off and you're trying to clear out the ads. Uh, you could go Nova Bomb if you want a little bit of burst DPS, depending on like what you're, you know, if you've got a bubble behind you, maybe you don't need the well quite as much. Um, could definitely run Nova Bomb for some DPS. Uh, as far as weapons go, I, yeah, I mentioned, uh, Fate Ringer and then, uh, Cartesian and then the last weapon on that, uh, would be a cataclysmic, right, for that sweet, sweet bait and switch, four times the charm, damage just pumping out. Um, you could also, uh, you know, uh, Izanagi's Burden and, like, a Battler. You know, Battler's, like, you can fire from the hip, hit these nodes easily, and it'll clear out the Harpies, you know, decently well. Um, the name of the Scout Rifle from last season is escaping me, but uh, that's always, a you know, always a pretty good option, I mean, which is weird. I don't, I don't use a lot of Scouts. Uh, and I can't even remember the name of it right now. Tarnished Metal. Um, 
a tarnished metal. Thank you, thank you. But yeah, that thing is also pretty good, honestly, especially if you're dealing if you want to pop those arc shields and then get some vol shot going. Um, honestly, any linear is going to be solid. You know, Taipan, Sales Fi, any anything like this that you're able to put out good crit damage with is going to be a great option here. Um, and then finally, after this, before we get to the final boss, we'll have our second secret chest, which you should definitely grab because you'll have gotten a few loot drops at this point. Uh, after you go through the kind of death fans area, but before you go through the last reactor or go into the reactor room, um, there is this area where you have to hit a few more nodes and there's like a hydra in the middle. Um, and a little air duct underneath some stairs in the corner is uh, a grate. You know, you shoot this open, you can drop down there and walk down to find a secret chest, as well as a little Warmind coffee mug, which unfortunately is not for sale in real life, which I'm, I was really miffed about. I, I would love a Warmind logo mug to be drinking my coffee out of in the morning. But anyways, after you have grabbed your secret chest, kind of go over to one of the corners of the room, you can drop down, and then we are headed into the final boss, which is where this dungeon really gets cooking. Court? What can you tell us about him? Yeah, you're you're going to get cooked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Persis uh, Primordial Ruin, uh, which is the big wyvern uh, chicken, if you want to call it. Uh, it is the uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, tight space. Uh, lots going on here, so we'll try and split things up nice and easy uh, for special enemies that you'll be uh, interacting with in this particular encounter. Uh, you will have two hydras that spawn in, one on the left side and one on the right, in the, the, the immediate room uh, that you spawn in and place your rally flag. Uh, killing these will, will, uh, will trigger the conduit minotaurs to also spawn on the left and right side uh, again a reminder that in master mode you may want to keep one up uh, so you don't have to deal with two aggressive overloads chasing you uh, because they always spawn together in pairs uh, so keep one up in master doesn't really matter in uh, in normal mode because they are pretty easy to deal with when we speak about the boss itself, it is a large wyvern, and it does have an intrinsic damage reduction modifier. Uh, so this damage reduction includes everything except super damage. Uh, so warlocks, this will be your. Uh, this is like the best encounter uh, to to really shine because well of radiance. When you, when the warlock owner of the well of radiance uh, is doing damage within their own well. All outgoing damage is considered super damage, which bypasses this DR. Uh, again, it only applies to the Well of Radiance owner and nobody else. So you could come in here with three Well of Radiance Warlocks, and they can all place their uh, Well of Radiance and sit in their own individual wells, and they'll do full damage, increased damage if you want to call it that. Um, for all other weapons, for other anything that's not a super you will be doing reduced damage in general this dr doesn't apply to its crit spots now, it does have one at the front it's very small though you are threading the needle here uh, and there is one at the rear but again <laughs> i'm not really sure how you'd get around to trying to do damage you know we'll have one person uh you know uh lead them off to another direction and have uh the two other guardians uh, deal with his, his rear crit spot, but very tricky to do that. Um, yeah, so that that's the overview, overview here for, for your the damage reduction. And there has been a little bit of misinformation that's going floating around here. It's not so much that you do increased damage with supers, it's that you're doing normal damage with supers and you're doing reduced damage with everything else. Uh, in terms of what you're going to be interacting with, our attrition buff is omnipresent throughout this encounter you will have four power nodes and cables the only two will be active uh, powering up these power nodes is what activates the boss damage phase uh, you'll also have five trigger nodes which is used to open and close the reactor blast door so the big objective here is you're luring Persis into the reactor room uh, and connecting the power nodes to overcharge the reactor and stun the boss so the strategy here the uh, beginning of this encounter and the start of each new phase will be very chaotic. There's a lot going on. Uh, we're in a pretty small space with the boss, so stay on your toes and keep moving. Use the geometry around the room for cover, 
from the boss as you float around. Crowd control is massive for the ads here. So using lingering grenades, vortex, storm, etc. Weather hordes really clutch here. Uh, just to slow down and control stasis as well is always a big kind of uh, one of my go-tos for controlling ads uh, and anything that's going to weaken ads will be very helpful here uh, so you want to focus the hydras down immediately to get the minotaurs to spawn in on each side of the map so you can progress the encounter once you've grabbed your buff clear a few ads and then open the rest of the arena up uh, by hitting the five node sequence in the middle of the arena uh, harpies and goblins will not shift to spawn it uh, to spawning inside the chamber and you'll be a little bit safer to this uh, while you're in the starting arena uh, so right next to the reactor uh, uh, right next to the reactor you'll have harpies and goblins spawning uh, infinitely uh, but when you spawn in at the uh, the rally banner you'll have uh, a, lot, a lot more breathing room and said that you will have the boss chasing around uh, he does like to stomp around and uh, <laughs> fly up in the air and do a good good old glide stomp into uh, any unsuspecting guardians. Quite humorous to, uh, to witness that. Uh, if you don't get killed by the, the, the big jump stomp, you may get killed by the, uh, the force of being thrown into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, while all this is happening... Uh, you'll need to complete the two yellow node branches on the left and or the right sides. The, the spawn of uh, of these two are completely random. You could have one on left, one on right, or both on left or both on uh, right. Uh, generally, when it comes to sort of player composition here, I know we don't tend to talk about um, for dungeons because it is just three of you. For this, it may be a little bit more important to kind of focus, right, who is doing what job here. Uh, so you can have two players focus on these while the third tries to draw the boss, kind of babysit the boss and draw any other ads away from the other two who are, are connecting up the sequences. Uh, it is important that you keep moving when in the reactor room as even a few seconds, a few seconds of hesitation can result in a harpy exploding you into 300 pieces. Uh, this will seem difficult in your first few runs, but much more naturally as you memorize the node locations and also uh, the ads uh, spawning as well. They, 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 it's not infinitely every five seconds, but it is infinitely every you know, 15, 20 seconds that they spawn in. Uh, and you can pop a wither horde or a vortex grenade when they're spawning in because you will see that vex effect when they're, they're phasing into the battlefield. Um, over fixating on finding them will almost always results, uh, result in an untimely death. Uh, uh, it, I'm referring to the, the uh, power nodes. Uh, if you can't find one, just back off, uh, kind of rearm yourself, get yourself uh, uh, your recovery back up to speed, and then go in for another shot. Uh, Arctrician buff does refresh. As I mentioned at the, at the top of this uh, uh, dungeon breakdown, uh, for five seconds every time you uh, trigger one, uh, but you can always refresh that buff by killing a minotaur. So don't feel like you need to rush here. There's no ultimate kind of um, time limit here. Uh, the, the the time limit is once you get the two uh, uh, power nodes done, uh, you need to get the hell out of this reactor uh, and ensure that the boss is in the reactor and not outside of it. Uh, so another crux that many players will run into is getting beamed by the Minotaurs as they exit uh, the reactor side doors. Uh, blinding grenades will be very helpful here to ensuring that you have an exit route uh, for both the Minotaurs and any goblins and harpies as well. Uh, your actual damage phase here is quite short. Uh, so think of think of Keitel. Keitel is a little bit different where you've got three burst DPS phases all in one. This is just one big burst damage phase. Uh, so high burst DPS is going to be your focus here. As I said, Persis does uh, receive uh, less damage that isn't a super. Uh, so you will be kind of scrambling to find something that's got high burst damage 
uh, appropriate for your class. A uh, solid team composition would also include Galhorn with two well-rolled legendary rockets, like Hotheads with field prep, count, uh, clown cartridge, auto-loading and explosive light. Other good options include Bump in the Knights, uh, His Inventions, Apex Predator, Blowout. You know, all these are rocket launchers. It's probably the best strat uh, that you can go in here uh, because Wolfpack Rounds does do reasonably good damage here. Uh, and, you know, it's a big enough target where a lot of these explosive damage is hitting uh, the boss. Alternatively, you do have some good supporting weapons, including Merciless, uh, fusions like Cartesian Coordinate, uh, auto-loading breach grenade launchers like Salvagers. These are all kind of good for either boss damage or add clear. Uh, and really, yeah, the balance against the short DPS phase is your ammo management. Uh, so using an exotic primary is a good way to slightly increase your heavy brick spawn rate. Uh, and Trinity Ghoul, Wrist Runner are really top tier for this. Uh, Jolt Shot SMGs as well, just kind of really control the, the battlefield and get that uh, as much kind of ammo optimization as possible. Uh, if you are on the master modes, and uh, something that we found out, uh, Impetus and I found out in our, our run last night, uh, Lucent Finisher, absolute godsend. Yeah. <laughs> you will never run out of heavy. <laughs> uh, I can recall there was like 10 bricks of heavy because I just kept finishing the minotaurs, uh, the, the overload minotaurs. So uh, when you are doing master uh, for this season, season uh, 19, that is the best strat. Uh, specifically for recommended builds and weapons, uh, with a horde, explosive, uh, sorry, blinding grenade launchers, SMG of choice. I mentioned Volt Shot. This season you've got the iClose SMG. Uh, rockets are. There is probably. <sighs> LFRs are probably really good because there's no DR in the, the crit spot. However, it's really tricky land those shots and if you don't land those shots especially when it comes to lfrs which do punish you for not hitting precision shots you might as well not use them <laughs> might as well just throw them away uh, and use rockets for this particular uh, damage phase uh, so rockets with wheel pack rounds are the clutch here uh, but if you feel really confident in doing so then you can go for the lfr strat uh, specifically for classes, uh, Fusion Grenades, Starfire Protocol build for our Warlock, Warlock friends, uh, Throwing Your Body, <laughs> which is your <laughs> Thunder Crash friends, uh, for Hunters, Gathering Storm, Blade Barrage, and Tether uh, with Star Eater Scales are your top tier burst damage uh, supers. Uh, Titans, they've got Bubble for Master, just to keep yourself protected. Uh, and arc for normal and warlocks well 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 uh that is the top tier super here just because of the way it interacts with uh Persis. uh for normal mode for well placement you can really place it anywhere you want uh yeah that's got direct line of sight with Persis. but when it comes to master difficulty you want to put that right at the far back of the room uh, just so you've got enough kind of uh, space uh, uh there's a few situations we were we were putting it in the middle of the room and Persis was he didn't enjoy that absolutely uh destroyed that well out of our uh, existence instantly uh, so, one stop yeah. just gone yeah so not advised <laughs> put that at the back of the map. <laughs> uh, uh, there you go. That is the end of the dungeon. Short and sweet, I would say. Uh, some very interesting interactions in terms of DRs, and you know, it's a little bit, a little bit different to what we're kind of come to expect with just using LFRs for everything. It's still possible in this dungeon, but I think rockets are the go-to just because of the, the large uh, uh, kind of. Uh, kind of body uh hits that you can you can make on on the boss here uh so what time are we thinking to complete so if you're brand new to this kind of expect this will go on much longer than one hour you know maybe an hour and a half 75 minutes maybe is the average and once you've practiced you can get that down to 40 minutes even 30 minutes if you're zooming through uh and generally what are our, our 
thoughts on this particular dungeon and where does it uh, kind of position in terms of other ranking versus other dungeons dif difficulty and loot uh, i'll start us off and say yeah it's quite short and sweet um it does have you know it's got the garden of salvation um kind of mechanics thrown in which which is nice to see i haven't played garden for a long time uh but uh, for me that's kind of you know I've, I've played garden i knew i know what to expect with the uh, the the first uh, boss uh, it was uh, it was it was a nice surprise uh, but you know we've already done this before um ranking event against other dungeons hmm it's maybe not my top tier, I think, despite the fact Duality's got some problems with the bells and some glitches and bugs here and there, I still think Duality's kind of at the top uh, or near enough the top because it's, it's a lot more farmable than, than, this, than this particular uh, uh, the, uh, this this particular dungeon uh, yeah. for the master version, for the master version. Uh, for the normal version, the first encounter for this, if you want to get that uh, that <laughs> cowboy hat or the uh, uh, the weapon, which we'll talk about, uh, long arm, uh, this this dungeon does have uh, a nice little kind of loop where you can keep farming encounter one. Uh, the loot itself, we'll talk about the loot very shortly. Uh, but what what do you guys think? The ranking and the dif difficulty versus other dungeons. Yeah, this you go ahead, man. Yeah, I, I still think duality, just normal and master mode, is is top of my list. Um, normal mode aspire though, I'd probably put that at second. That's my. It's just it's a fun one. Um, I really do like it. I like that the encounters are kind of quick. The damage phases are different, and that's always nice to see. Um, yeah, master wise though, uh, definitely the worst master dungeon. <laughs> definitely the worst master dungeon. Uh, Grasp definitely takes number two for my spot as as something that I'm willing to play all the way through and then also farm. I'm not willing to play all the way through or farm Master Spire the Watcher right now uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, it seems like the Artifice armor is dropping horribly low stats for Spire right now. That's clearly a bug, but I did get a 56 stat armor piece, Artifice armor piece last night, which was Ooh. awesome. Um, don't know why that's the case, but hopefully that will get fixed. Even though, even even once it does get fixed, though, I'm just outside of that first encounter. I'm not. The rest of the dungeon is is can be a bit of a slog. So, yeah, it, it's kind of a shame. But again, on normal mode, I, I enjoy it a lot, and I will always be ready to play it. Definitely, will do some runs of it when it comes around in rotation in future seasons next year. Or so, um, I don't I don't consider this to be a bad dungeon by any means. I think it's a great great series of encounters the mechanic is simple but it's it's something that you can't master like memorizing the routes is a skill and and that's a fun thing to progress through knowing where all these things line up so that you could just zoom through each of these encounters especially that first one where you're climbing the tower that's just it's a lot of fun knowing where they all link up and trying to go as fast as you can as you get to the top making it a race with your fire team i love that i think that's going to be great how about you saint yeah i think something i've noticed when I'm like thinking about all the raids is the way that they will take a mechanic that is like, you know, relatively simple and then just kind of like build on that a little bit throughout the raid. And then they want to bring in like an additional level of difficulty with a lot of like the final raid bosses. Right. So if we think about um, like the Kel Echo or if we think about like Keitel or, um, you know, Spire too, right. The bot like, there's like the base mechanic which is fine and it's like not too difficult but the you know you have this very lethal like very mobile boss um is just like kind of adds on another like interesting layer to the fight right you're moving around the bells with Keitel or in prophecy you're kind of chasing the boss platform to platform and then here we're um you know we're we're basically you just have a very mobile boss itself even though it's like not moving around a ton but just like being next to the boss uh, in such a tight space, yeah, um, yeah, that that's that's definitely very unique, uh, and I like that. I, um, I mean, I'd probably say that prophecy is still my favorite dungeon, which I know that's like pretty old, but I just like I like the bosses, I like the loot, I liked the style, you know, um, 
I definitely think that Spire is very fun. I, I really love the theme that they went for, right? Like seeing Tex Mechanica kind of like become a weapon foundry was like super cool, right? And I mean, this is something that uh, Chris and Vivian were like, minorly hinting at you know when we when we were like talking about the interview and they were like oh well what do you think a tex mechanica trait would be? And I'm like <laughs> my man is trolling right now all right he know they already made one it's coming out in three weeks you know or, or whatever it was but uh yeah so I, I love the theme of the guns um some people were like really down about the first boss and it was it was reused from garden that didn't really, I don't know, it didn't really bother me that much because it's like half of it's different and only like a little, it's this one part of the fight is the same. Uh, and plus the funnel boss is like a totally unique, uh, you know, fight and end model and all that, which I think balances that out. Um, because like if you look at like some of these other dungeons, were the other bosses in the dungeons like really that unique in mechanics for like the first boss phase in a dungeon? And like they're really not. So I think that that was like a maybe a, uh, I, don't, I don't know just like a disproportionate expectation that the first boss would be like some weird unique thing uh, uh, yeah court. that is a fair point because galran we had that with the now sunset uh, uh crown of sorrow crown. Uh, mm -hmm. raid that was a very similar setup where you're up in his face slicing mm -hmm. and dicing uh, and we're doing that again swords seem to be a really good strap for for duality uh, but uh, yeah, no, that's that's a fair point. And to be honest, you know, all three of us, uh, you know, we've we've played or we've we've at least seen a lot of Garden of Salvation uh, in our times and our travels throughout Destiny. Uh, but some people haven't. Whether they've played mm. Destiny two from the start, they haven't played a raid, or they've barely touched Garden of Salvation because it's not it's not a raid that people run a lot nowadays. Uh, but also new lights as well. This this is going to be new for them. This particular uh, uh, boss uh, encounter, uh, we've seen it before, and yeah, it can sometimes be a bit lame to see it come up again as a as a dungeon boss. But uh, I think it, it was a nice kind of combination of old and new mechanics kind of coming together uh, for 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 Spire. Yeah, I don't want to uh, spoil too much about the lore of the dungeon, but there is a mm. reason why that Hydra is so similar to the one that we fight in Garden of Salvation. They are a part of the same branch of Vex. Again, I don't want to get into specifics. I don't want to spoil anything, but um, there's there's a there's a reason. It's not just you know a bunch of devs are lazy reusing enemies, but there, there's a reason that particular enemy does show up again. Um, they are they are related to the Garden of Salvation Vex. So uh, if you're interested in the lore there, you know, again, go do the dungeon. Also go do the raid. There's some very interesting lore about that particular group of Vex and why they're showing up, both in the Garden of Salvation and in the Spire of the Watcher. All right. Any more uh, comments about the dungeon before we sort of head over to our weapon breakdown? Let's talk about some loot. Yeah. Mm. Uh, before we start our weapons breakdown, uh, I will just talk about very briefly where you can get... Uh, the loot. Uh, so just a reminder uh, that the duration of season 19 and 20, uh, you can farm every encounter of this dungeon to get the weapons and armor that you want, uh, both normal and master version. Uh, Hierarchy of Needs, the exotic bow, still has a weekly lockout of one per character, so that's three per, uh, uh, three chances per week. Uh, but completing various triumphs does increase the drop chance. And when we get to season 21, which is when we'll get a brand new dungeon, uh, this will be put into the rotating dungeon schedule, uh, presumably the week after duality. Uh, I'm presuming that's still going to be the, the sort of the thing that we'll be doing uh, weekly. Uh, so it'll once again become farmable, uh, including hierarchy when it is featured. So for the first encounter, you can get Longarm, you can get Seventh Seraph, Carbine, and you can get Terminus Horizon. Uh, for the second encounter, you can get Terminus Horizon uh, and the uh, Officer Revolver. And for the final encounter, you've got Wilder Flight, you've got uh, Liminal Vigil, and you've got Hierarchy of Needs, which is the exotic, plus any weapon from previous encounters. It's got that double drop. Uh, for armor, uh, head, arms, and legs for first encounter, for uh, uh, for second encounter, it's arms, chest, and class item. And for the final encounter, it's just a, a chance for any armor piece. 
So, weapons. We have two origin traits here that they don't roll on the same weapons. We've got two different weapon sets here, uh, technically. Uh, we've got the text balance stock, which is text weapons only. Damaging targets while firing from the hip increases handling, reload speed and movement speed while aiming down sights. Uh, still working on the technical details here. I think it's, I think last time I saw it was about 30 handling and, you know, it's kind of down that kind of range of, uh, you know, plus 30, plus 20, etc. But uh, still work in progress. Uh, so that's for the text weapons only. You've got Rasputin's Arsenal, which we have covered before because we did talk about uh, this uh, sort of Seven Seraph and the Iklos weapons. Uh, so breaking a target shield partially reloads this weapon's magazine. Technically, this means on Elemental, Champion Barrier or Guardian Shield break, it refills 50% of the magazine. And just final note here, Spire and the two... Sorry, the... Uh, the Spire text mechanic weapons and the two seventh serif weapons are not craftable. Uh, so master version of Spire drops artifice armor uh, instead of your sort of craftable or uh, uh, adept versions. Uh, I'll be kicking things off with a, I don't think, lackluster <laughs> auto rifle here. <laughs> uh, it's the seventh serif carbine. It is a kinetic precision auto rifle. That's 450 RPM. The frame bonus is that this weapon's recoil pattern is more predictably vertical. Uh, reminder, 7th Seraph weapons can also spawn Warmind cells, just like its Icolos uh, cousins. Uh, we have had a major perk pool change, which I'll really quickly uh, uh, go through here. So in column 2, which is the magazine, uh, for removed, uh, we've got armor piercing rounds, high cal, light mag, and ricochet rounds. They've been replaced by Akurai's rounds, Seraph rounds, steady rounds, and tactical mag. Uh, for column three, we've got alt loading holster, slide shot, and underdog. They have been swapped out for dyna dynamic sway reduction, uh, pugilist, and reconstruction. And for column four, we had rampage and vorpal weapon swapped out for frenzy and target lock. Uh, the stats versus its kind of archetype peers, we're kind of comparing it with uh, Braytek, Werewolf, Tiger Spite, and Fire Fright. Uh, it's got 58 range, which is tied for its lowest. It's 39 stability. Again, it's pretty low. 41 reload, only second lowest. Uh, 39 handling, tied for lowest. 34 aim assist, lowest. <laughs> Noticing a trend here. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Uh, 74 recall direction, which is tied for the highest, oh. uh, which doesn't really matter for this particular oh. frame because of the uh, <laughs> the frame bonus here. Uh, so competitors, as I said, Tiger Spite, Braytick, and Fire Fright uh, doesn't lose by more than five points in any category. <laughs> but it's pretty much it's pretty much the worst kinetic four fifty in terms of base stats. It does it can spawn war mind cells. <laughs> <laughs> it's got something, you know. Um, for my. Uh, for barrels and magazines, uh, fluted or small bore, uh, investing in recall direction is a trap. Again, it's like that's not the way you want to go down with uh, with uh, precision auto rifles. Um, magazine surf rounds is a uh, a new perk for for ser uh, the carbine, uh, so we're probably going to be aiming for that. Uh, for the main perks, column three. Uh, fourth time's the charm is here. Reconstruction, pugilist, those again, those two new ones for column four, target lock, frenzy, swashbuckler. Uh, we were talking about uh, fourth time's the charm and target lock last episode. We did a big breakdown. So this may be the combo that you want to go down. Not saying it's going to be as good as uh, the the machine guns that can roll this, but it's definitely an option if you if you think you'll enjoy the carbine. Um, in terms of the masterwork mod preference range here, uh, you don't really need stability. Otherwise, it's a free pick. It's entirely up to you. Uh, the weapon mods, minor spec. Not going to be using. Uh, major boss spec on this otherwise it's backup mag if you want to uh, pair that with uh, four times the charm and target lock so your sustained damage 
uh, <laughs> full on quotes sustained uh, damage build is your fourth times the charm and target lock. And for the melee build, you've got Pugilist and Swashbuckler. Although Braytech Werewolf also has this role. So, overall, not, it's definitely not a, uh, a weapon that I'm going to be chasing, though it keeps dropping for me, and uh, <laughs> I'm kind of mad about it. <laughs> yes. Um, all right, Saint, have you got any improvements with the hand cannon? Well, unfortunately, uh, if you thought that bad, it gets worse. You know, if you <laughs> thought uh, we, were, we weren't uh, having a great start here, I... I I struggle to say that this thing is any better. Honestly, I, I probably would take a target lock AR over the hand cannon, but you know, we, we, we'll talk about it. All right. It's a weapon in the, the game destiny two in a dungeon. All right. So it's getting covered. Uh, it's the all time we, weapons. <laughs> it is, you know, of all of the ones that have been added to the game, it is, it's definitely one of them. Um, it did get uh, kind of a buff. I, I, actually, not kind of a buff. Definitely a buff um, in its mag options. They rem they didn't remove anything, but they did add Seraph rounds, which is great. That's that's a great perk. Uh, it's like combines like benefits from like all the rounds perks, right? Um, for our call them three traits, we lost firmly planted pulse monitor, threat detector, and underdog, but gained air assault, rangefinder, reconstruction, and well rounded. And then in column four, we lost Feeding Frenzy, Multi-Kill Clip, Osmosis, and Timed Payload, and gained Guts Shot, Harmony, Perfect Float, and Redirection. Uh, the loss of Timed Payload is, is just a huge uh, disappointment to me on this gun because Timed Payload is such a rare perk. Uh, it just really does not come up on very many weapons. This is one of the few that had it. It's a consistent, nice damage perk. It's just slightly better than Explosive Payload. And uh, we got, uh, like, Redirection, you know, kind of, like, in its place, or Harmony um, and Gut Shot, which are... They just don't have the consistency, the uptime, and the benefits that something like time payload does and especially the, like the range and, and how that works and how that affects a 180 um because this thing needs range okay let's be very clear uh it, it's you know it's it's really only competitor in the kinetic slot for 180s right now is survivors epitaph um and that's what we'll be comparing it to um there's a few other 180s in the game but you know trying to keep it consistent here for like what you know where this would be used and all that jazz because it does have a peer um which again uh it's kind of a similar story to the auto rifle uh it's pretty much the inferior weapon uh in, in in most of its its stats um range is 28 which is a few points lower handling is 30 which is the worst slower uh stability is 52 which is lower uh the reload beats it out by a four points actually uh 49 versus i think 45 uh and then it has 18 airborne effectiveness which is is pretty high um so this is a gun that can go down that route, but I don't know how many people are using 180 RPM hand cannons in the Crucible right now. Could be wrong. Maybe I'm out of touch with the meta, but uh, yeah, not not a great stat set here uh, for a 180 and definitely beaten out by some of the other energy 180s that we've seen around recently. Um, when we talk about actual perks, if... You know, if you're a 180 kind of guy and uh, you want to use this gun, I'm, I'm yeah, it's fine. Uh, I'm not going to be here to yuck <laughs> your yuck, so to say. You, you can, you can have it. All right, you, you can, you can take this thing out for a spin. And on that roll, I, I probably would recommend uh, Corkscrew is just like a nice general stat bonus because it needs it in all of them. Uh, and then Seraph Rounds is also a very solid bonus, right? Really, really, it's like the best mag option in the game. Um, for main traits, you know, maybe four times Reconstruction and Vicious Assassin are okay, you know, third column perks. Vorpal Weapon, Redirection, Harmony, your damage dealers. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to be picking Gut Shot. Um, Masterwork, uh, maybe range. Uh, the, the, the range is really low. It's 28 range in this thing. It's not a lot of, not much range past a high range SMG or something like that, right? Um, if you want to go for your Lucky Pants build, you could, you know, roll with, like, a Reconstruction, like, four times a charm at, like, Vorpal. Uh, super niche. Um, or, you know, maybe Harmony and, like, Reconstruction or Redirection uh, is interesting. Redirection got a little bit of a buff. Needs a bigger buff. 
Uh, and if you're not using that, I just, just use something else, you know, uh, it's, it was really tough to see this thing lose time payload and osmosis, uh, in a reprise. Honestly, I think one of the weaker reprises that we have seen in a while, uh, moving on, <laughs> we, uh, we've, we've got a better weapon. Okay. And we, we do, we do. What, and I can't is, believe I'm saying that. that. I really can't believe I'm saying that, but here I am talking about a sidearm. Now, I'm, I am known to be a, a sidearm hater in PvE, um, <laughs> but Bungie found out about our new section that we have in the podcast called Impetus Eats Crow, and so they have come out with Liminal Vigil. This is a stasis aggressive burst sidearm that's 320 rounds per minute. That's a hard-hitting two-burst fire is what the frame entails here. Uh, we do have one other... I've, it's a kinetic one, but they're in the same slot. We probably have to come up with some better terminology. <laughs> it's it's a kinetic sidearm. This is empirical evidence from the throne world. That one is craftable. They're, it's in the same slot as Liminal Vigil, but they are different elements. That's what I'm trying to get around to. So that's what I will be comparing this to. Uh, on the stat side, things are looking noticeably better than the uh, Seven Seraph comparisons here. So we have 58 range on Liminal Vigil. That is six more than empirical evidence. 39 stability, also six more than uh, evidence, 35 handling, which is one more than evidence, and 20 reload, which is four less than empirical evidence. So uh, statistically superior across the board, and it also has better perks for PBE, which is what we like to see here. Now, in terms of our barrels and mags on sidearms, uh, do remember that the range band is severely compressed here on sidearms. This is kind of a, a known thing, of course, if you use them in PvP. Uh, I'm not going to recommend specking into the range stat for sidearms. Uh, this has, of course, been my big criticism with them. At that point, just use an SMG where you can excel at the ranges that you're trying to squeeze these little tiny bits of a meter out to for your sidearms. So don't worry about the range stat. Go into stability or handling or reload speed. You'll get better benefits. You'll get more benefits out of that than you would in the range stat. So for a barrel, fluted barrel for me is going to be nice. There is uh, There are some perk combinations in columns three and four that might necessitate polygonal if you really are having trouble controlling the stability. So fluted, polygonal, we say that a lot. Those are our most frequent recommendations. We're sitting at a 94 recoil direction, so no need to worry about getting that up. Um, you're getting just the teeniest amount of uh, bonus from Arrowhead. Um, and with Chamber Compensator, of course, we don't want to hurt that handling since that's already one of our lower stats. So ignore those two. Go for Fluted. Go for Polygonal if you need that extra help controlling the two kick. Uh, on the magazine side, we've got the three round options. We're big fans of those on the show. Everyone knows that. Also, Flare to Magwell. Again, there's there's some perks in Columns 3 and 4 where having a higher reload speed might be a little bit more beneficial here. You could also do Light Mag if you wanted to, even Alloy Mag. This will kind of be a little bit more situational, but uh, it might behoove you to get that reload speed up from 20 if you really want. But if that's not a problem for you, then we've got Armor Piercing, Ricochet, and High Cal there to uh, help out with the stability if you'd like. Okay, on to columns three and four. We have uh, new this season. Uh, this is one of two weapons that has headstone in column three. That has instantly caught my eye. Very interesting. We've also got tunnel vision. Uh, I don't normally recommend this perk in PvE, but there is a perk in column four that would make a pretty good pairing with tunnel vision, so that's why I'm bringing it to your attention. Threat detector, kind of a classic go-to perk for sidearms and SMGs. We've got Pugilist and, of course, another podcast-approved perk, Perpetual Motion. In column four, we've got Swashbuckler, Desperado showing up for the first time on a sidearm, and then again, the the classic S, uh, sidearm perk, Surrounded. So lots and lots of really good options here. This is quite a juiced, uh, from a PvE point of view, a juiced sidearm, so... Um, there, there are some combinations that if they did drop for me, I, I might have to give them a shot. Maybe it could change my mind, but again, I can't craft this, so I do have to rely on RNG. No need to get my hopes up now. Uh, on the Masterwork and Weapon Mod side here, again, Masterwork, I'm, I'd probably be leaning towards stability. I haven't gotten a Desperado roll of this yet, so I don't know how that, that kick feels when you do get into that faster firing rate on a sidearm. 
But uh, so I'll just say right now, you know, from an uninformed point of view, just kind of looking at it on paper, I'm probably leaning towards stability handling. Again, if reload speed ends up being an issue, maybe that as my masterwork option there just to make sure that I can hit those headshots. Uh, on the mag side, or sorry, on the weapon mod side, um, yeah, probably minor spec is really what I'm interested in. Um, if I needed a few more bullets, maybe backup mag, but uh, again, definitely not major or minor. And I definitely don't need to worry about counterbalance at all. So now let's get into our recommended combos. If you want to do a stasis melee build or just a general melee build, we do have Pugilist Swashbuckler. That's always a solid combination. If you want the classic sidearm roll, Threat Detector Surrounded. Again, this is just such a strong perk pairing for SMGs and sidearms. They just work so well in those close range engagements. And you will be getting this combo to proc all the time in this dungeon particularly. So uh, that's always an option there. And then if you want to go for the unique role, the if you can land your precision kills, there is the Headstone Desperado perk combo, which is very, very spicy to me. Even as the uh, the sidearm hater, I, I do want to get this perk combo. Uh, maybe this is the one that gets me to change my mind. I don't know. I haven't gotten it yet. Uh, but uh, yeah, that could be very solid. Headstone and Surrounded or Headstone Swashbuckler. Again, very, very nice. Double damage perks are pretty much always something of interest to us when we're looking at the perk pools for new weapons as they come out season over season. So um, I, I would definitely play around with any of those. But again, I want to get Desperado as this is the first sidearm to get it. And then Headstone showing up in Calm 3 on the same weapon is, is really the cool part. So we shall uh, we shall see whether or not this is the sidearm to get me to change my mind. But uh, definitely one of the most juiced rolls, uh, juiced loopholes on a, on a weapon dropping from a dungeon that we've had in a while. So uh, yeah, very interesting. This is, of course, a Tex weapon as well. So you do have that origin trait helping uh, if you want to try and fire a Desperado sidearm from the hip, uh, more power to you. That's all I'll say on that front. Uh, Saint, what can you tell us about uh, about the long arm? The long arm has got to be my favorite weapon from this dungeon. I've definitely spent some time uh, farming that encounter, the, the Ascend the Spire encounter, getting some better versions of this. So I've been using it quite a bit, honestly, this season so far. Uh, the long arm is an arc aggressive frame scout rifle, 120 RPM. This is a brand new frame type, and it's kind of like a legendary DMT. Uh, it has the same like reload mechanic, um, you know, just the way the weapon looks. A lot of things like that are going to be very reminiscent of DMT. Um, but the hip fire is is not quite the same. If if you are somebody that has um, you know, no judgment. It's fine. You, you've you been capitalizing on DMT in the Crucible recently, and you try to swap out uh, that gun for the long arm. Uh, the I think that you'll find that the hip fire accuracy is not quite the same. You know, DMT is an exotic, and it feels exotic, uh, and it's going to be tough to get that same kind of hip fire accuracy from this gun. Um, but it's, it you know, there are some ways to use it from the hip, so to say, and to, and to try to capitalize on that text Mechanica perk. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. So uh, how does this compare? You know, obviously it has no peers because it's a brand new weapon. So how does this compare to like a high impact scout? Uh, you know, high impacts are... 150 RPM uh, versus 120 RPM on the aggressive, you know, 67 to like 100 impact. Um, and this is, you know, kind of like the the gist of it is when we are comparing this to a high impact scout, it's going to have a little bit less range. And it's going to have a little bit better handling, reload, and aim assist. So, you know, that's kind of like your archetype general there. This could change as this is the very first one of its type. Uh, we may see something more like this in the future, but it's it feels like it definitely fit right at home here in this Tex Mechanica themed uh, set, right in the theme dungeon. Um, barrels, uh, you know, you've got some options: uh, corkscrew, fluted, small bore. If you want extra handling range, kind of depends where your major traits land. Um, I was like fluted for extra handling. You know, it feels really nice. That plus fifteen points is huge. Corkscrew is a great plus five, uh, kind of across the board there. Um, as far as mag goes, I. 
am probably going TAC Mag. I mean, it's just the best because of all the benefits that it has to offer there. Uh, TAC's giving you the extra bullet in the mag, plus 10 reload, a little bit of stability. I don't feel that the stability is super necessary because of how slow the weapon fires. I don't feel like it's very hard to control the recoil. Um, but something like a pinned mag could be good uh, if you're rolling with uh, subsistence, which is a third column trait. Uh, also in the third column, the main traits, you know, we got uh, rapid hit and wellspring, which are really strong, uh, nice options. Um, and then column four, uh, adrenaline junkie, dragonfly, and explosive payload. So some pretty strong options here uh, that we can pair together. I am probably going range or reload, depending, again, on where my main traits land. Uh, if I'm explosive, right, I'm less worried about range. If I'm subsistence uh, or, or something like that, I'm maybe a little less worried about my reload. Uh, and the reason I talk about reload, again, is because of the way that it reloads a couple bullets at a time, just like DMT. So it is kind of something to keep in mind. Um, and then, you know, another interesting thing I've noticed is that I, I I like rapid hit a lot when I'm able to, like, lane. You know, I'm, I'm ADS from a long way away, and I can land all my shots. But um, if you fully empty your mag and you're trying to put 15 bullets back in, I think that rapid hit can fall off before you can fully reload your magazine just because of the way that it works. Um, so still really strong perk, though, just because of the reload buffs and the stability buffs that you're getting from rapid hit there. Um your kind of GM role, if I'm taking this in this season, uh, you know, rapid hit or uh, dragonfly and explosive payload. I really like a rapid hit explosive payload role. I'm still grinding for that one. Um, you know, we'll hopefully get one of those soon. Uh, explosive payload is also really nice for if you do want to use this from the hip. Uh, hip fire grip is on this weapon. I, I think it's kind of a trap, but uh, if you want to put on a free hand grip mod and you get one with hip fire grip and explosive payload, uh, feel free to go to town and have some fun. You just probably are not going to be hitting very many crits uh, it, while using the weapon like that. Um, for a just straight up grenade utility build, we have Wellspring and Adrenaline Junkie. Um, and then, you know, kind of add clear side, you could go for a subsistence as well as Adrenaline Junkie. Uh, both of those two roles I are incredibly strong. Uh, I'm still playing a lot of Arc Titan these days, and man, does I have a subsistence AJ role, and it just fits so nicely into that build. Uh, Wellspring would be even better for a build flow, right, for getting grenade energy back. Um, and then rapid hit, you know, would be even better fight for in-game where you're not clearing out so many enemies so quickly. But yeah, great weapon, a lot of fun to use. It's effective, it's got good range, it's got solid perk options, but uh, I don't know what else to say. You guys use long arm at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What are your favorites? What are you sticking to? Well, uh, it's been a personal sticking point of mine that I still haven't gotten rapid hit explosive payload despite farming over and over again. Yeah. Multiple different groups, but I, I have had uh, Rabbit Hit Dragonfly. That's what I currently have. That's quite strong. And then I do have the, I did get the Wellspring Adrenaline Junkie role, and it is nice. it is quite nice. nice. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up is, is another brand new archetype. Man, how about that? Court, what's going on over here? What is this? Yeah. Thing? Yes, it is the Wilder Flight, which is the Void Double Fire breach loading grenade launcher so that's special ammo and yeah it's a new frame it's uh effectively you know and the best way to describe it is one ammo shoots two grenade projectiles uh very interesting concept here and uh pretty hard to find a comparison especially because you know old void uh breach loading grenade launchers are uh are they're not up to scratch they're they're pretty old out there uh, i think truth tellers maybe it's closest competitor but that's a bit of a stretch uh so we'll we'll for perspective wise we'll, we'll compare it with truth teller uh so weather flight's got 60 blast radius versus the 100 that comes as standard on truth teller though you do get the two grenades which results in a much kind of wider radius area of effect uh, so to speak um, you can damage multiple targets rather than just one or up to multiple targets than just one or a couple with Truth Teller. Uh, it's got 93 uh, versus Truth Teller's 74 velocity, so it's pretty speedy projectile here. Um, it's pretty poor handling though, 43 versus 69, so you may need to kind of spec into that if you're using this as a kind of hot swap build. And it's got pretty poor reload as well, 32 versus 72. Uh, that truth or truth teller has 
Uh, something we tend not to talk about, as it's pretty uh, fairly scientific topic. Uh, Truth Teller has a much higher inventory size stat of 65 versus Wilder Flights 10. Uh, so inventory size stat governs how much ammo in reserves and how much ammo you pick up from bricks. 10 is a very poor stat. Um, I mean, you do get far less reserves uh, in your backpack and pick up gains when paired with reserve mods. Uh, so it, it likely low because Wild of Flight has that, you know, twin fire. Uh, so the price of uh, two for the price of one, uh, thus increasing its viability in a different in a different way. Uh, but just to take that as a note, uh, if you're uh, considering taking uh, reserve mods with this. So, yeah, like I said, Truth Teller is pretty fairly old special grenade launcher, so it's not up to uh, present perk standards. Wild of Flight now occupies that traditional grenade launcher impact plus explosive or utility role. Uh, don't forget, we still have the oldish Void uh, Wave Frame, which is definitely Whisper, uh, for the sort of long distance add clear role, though again, that's also lacking for the current uh, and new perks. Uh, so it's kind of, it's its own thing right now, a bit like uh, Long Arm, it exists in its own category uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing, you know, other elements for uh, Wilder Flight. Uh, so, barrels and magazines for the launcher barrels, quick launch for that plus 7 velocity, again it's already got pretty high, that would be, that maximise it up to 100 and you get that plus 15 handling, uh, which is maybe the one that you're you want to head for, just really bump up that handling uh, stat. You've got smart drift control for that plus 15 recoil direction, plus 10 stability, plus 10 handling, and plus 5 velocity, uh, and linear compensator for that plus 5 blast radius velocity and stability. Quick launch is probably your go-to here. For the magazine, uh, blinding, uh, th there is a sort of fork in the road here. Uh, it really depends on what... Uh, a kind of type of weapon you want to use here. Uh, so for utility builds, you've got the blinding uh, grenades, and for sort of more traditional damage, uh, you've got spike grenades for for impact damage. Uh, reminder that blinding does reduce your blast radius by minus one hundred. Uh, which is even more of a detriment to Wilder Flight because you can't stack on top of that. There's, there's absolutely no way you can get more than zero uh, blast radius on Wilder Flight. Uh, so just take that in con uh, consideration. Uh, for the main perks, for Column 3, we've got some really pretty interesting ones here. We've got All Loading Holster. That's your kind of big plus for uh, auto loading grenade launch hot swapping builds. Repulsive Brace is here as a void weapon after all. Uh, Demolitionist is here. Unrelenting is also here. That's a really kind of classic one if you're using this as a kind of hit and run to get your health regen up. Uh, for column four, you've got Adrenaline Junkie. You've got Lead from Gold, Frenzy, Vorpal, and Disruption Break. Uh, mod preferences here. Again, it's a bit of a free pick. All four do have their uses. However, Handling is the best one if you're going for that hot swap auto reloading build uh, weapon mod I, major specs probably your 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 go-to here uh, just to kind of combine uh, combine it with uh, at least for this season we've got uh, grenade launcher unstoppable uh, you could use this if you're going down the route of a damage build for for this grenade launcher so the builds here we've got the bog standard blinding builds that's blinding grenades auto loading holster and disruption break reminder that disruption break uh does uh when you break the enemy shield you get a 50 percent uh debuff uh that's uh sorry kinetic damage debuff that stacks with other debuffs uh so you can use that hot swap back to your uh your prime uh your primary weapon and uh, go in for the the kill there uh for your Void 3.0 build, very interesting combination here. You've got Repulsor Brace, or you can go down the route of Demo or Adrenaline Junkie. Pair that with Echo of Undermining, which is the uh, the weakened grenades, to apply weakened to Void grenades for that synergy. I know I've been using a little bit of this. I don't have the exact role, uh, but with your Falcons with Repulsor Brace, I don't have a really good Column 4 uh, perk just yet, but... Uh, 
being able to pair this with your falcons to apply volatile rounds, uh, sorry, volatile on the uh, enemy, and to proc that over shield from repulsive brace. It's very interesting. I really, it's a very unique combination because it has that kind of um, uh, best of both worlds from the the utility build and the damage build here. Because I'm getting my own uh, overshield here, uh, so that's one I'm I'm particular uh interested in because uh, i've already got blinding uh grenade launcher's got kind of three of each element at this point <laughs> uh but uh very interesting weapon very uh interesting to see where they go with the the double fire uh, and maybe see other elements you know May we see a vote shots double fire grenade launcher <laughs> dear god <laughs> uh all right uh, we do have a machine gun, a heavy weapon that Impetus is going to talk about here. Yes, this is Terminus Horizon Arc High Impact Machine Gun. That's 360 rounds per minute. That is a uh, frame bonus of slow firing, high damage, and it is more accurate when stationary, moving slowly, and aiming down sights, and or aiming down sights, I should say. Um Stats versus archetype peers. We do actually have two competitors uh, when it comes to arc high impact machine guns. The old uh, Vanguard drop, or I should say uh, Nightfall drop, that would be the Swarm. That did have an adept version. And then if we go even further back, we did have the classic 7th Seraph Saw that is not returned this season, just to rub salt in the wounds there. Uh, that, of course, was quite notable because it could make uh, War Mine Cells, who's fantastic for ad clears. So. We've got those two options here. So when we look at the stats, it is actually quite competitive here. Terminus sitting at 64 range. That's five less than the Swarm, but two more than Saw. 25 stability, that is eight less than Swarm, but three more than Saw. 38 handling, which is three more than Swarm, and 10 more than Saw. And then 24 reload speed, which is 14 less than the Swarm, and six less than Saw. So solidly middle of the pack in stats but this does come out with uh, some pretty top tier perks for pve so uh but again when we look at the stats here thinking about okay what are some pain points that we need to address here stability and reload speed are kind of the ones that i'm really uh focused on when i'm thinking about barrels and magazines handling is just going to be low because it's a machine gun it's a heavy weapon that's just how these things work um, we can, you know, we can find some ways to address that, but I'm more concerned with stability, making sure that I can actually land my shots and then making sure I can reload on a quick time before I, uh, get killed. So those are the two that I'm looking at here. When we talk about our barrels and our magazine, uh, stability stat or reload speed, I can't really do anything about reload speed on my barrels. So I'm going to focus on stability. We've got polygonal, we've got flared magwell. Those are kind of the ones that I really want to press upon. We talk about this all the time, but those stat bumps do matter here. Uh, do want to also touch on our recoil direction. We are sitting at 74. Uh, you could take that all the way up to 100. If you wanted to with arrowhead break, that will boost the handling up to 48 it's definitely an option there. I don't think I'd you know, be disappointed if my Terminus dropped with this. Uh, I'm definitely not going to touch Chambered. I don't want to hurt my handling any more than it's at right now. So uh, for me, the top options there are probably Polygonal, then Fluted or Arrowhead Break uh, would be my follow-up choices. On the uh, magazine side here, I'm going to actually recommend everything but Extended Mag because Extended Mag is going to take my reload speed of 24 all the way down to four. And unless I get a really solid reload perk in uh, column three, that's just not worth it. So uh, I think alloy magazine for faster reloads when the magazine is empty, there's definitely a use case for that. Appended bag gives me a few more bullets. I'll take that. We've got our three rounds perks there. That's going to be helpful. Although I don't think the range stat needs to be bumped up, but again, there's some utility to high cal and armor piercing, so I'm fine with that. And ricochet does give me 10 stability as well as five range, so that's got a use case there. Flared magwell, of course, hitting the two stats that I needed to hit, which were reload speed and stability. Definitely appreciate that. And then light mag giving me a boost to my reload speed and a tiny boost to range. So I think there's an argument to be made for all those extended mag. You know, the extra bullets are nice, but I can get extra bullets other ways. And so I don't think the benefits of extended mag 
uh, matter, and they certainly don't outweigh that minus 20 to reload speed. So avoid extended mag if you can. Now on to the juicy stuff here. Starting in column three, we have Dragonfly. A damage perk showing up there. That's great to see. Again, Dragonfly is fantastic on machine guns. It does come with a multiplier of times four. Uh, when you land that precision kill. So it is a very powerful ad clear perk on machine guns. I do recommend it. Uh, but we'll talk about in a moment why I'm a little hesitant to recommend Dragonfly on this particular weapon. Uh, we've also got Compulsive Reloader. That's a reload perk. Definitely appreciate that. Triple Tap, fantastic option for reloading. I just avoid it entirely by getting bullets straight into my magazine as I'm firing and landing those precision shots. Rabbit Hit, another great option for hitting stability and reload speed. And then finally, Demolitionist. So actually a lot of really great ways to overcome that really, really terrible reload speed stat of 24. Very, very exciting to see that. And when we look at our damage options in column four, we've got some very exciting ones. We've got Volt Shot, we've got Cascade Point, we've got Adrenaline Junkie. I'm not gonna recommend high impact reserves. We've got Wellspring as well. That's gonna be very utility strong utility wise. And then we've got Target Lock. I don't want to spend too much time on Cascade Point and Target Lock, considering we just talked about these last episode. If you want to get a, a refresher on the details, go listen to that again. We've got timestamps for those two perks. But again, we're thinking about that Lightfall Heavy Weapon rework that Bungie's been teasing. We don't know the details as of this recording, so I would say that if you get a Cascade Point or a Target Lock roll, hold on to them for now, right? You don't want to have to go back in after the meta has shifted to try and chase these rules down. Let's be prepared for whatever changes are coming. So hold on to that. Uh, for target lock, the most natural pairing is going to be triple tap. I mean, that's really the best sustained damage build that you can have if, you know, machine guns do end up being a mini boss or a boss damage. Uh, if they get a buff in that regard, that would be the role I'd want to go chase. And on a high impact, you know, that's got a great impact stat. That could be quite powerful. We'd use that for our sustained damage builds. Alternatively for cascade point, uh, maybe rapid hit, you know, demolitionist. I'm trying to think of how we get bullets back in so that we can start going through that ammunition quite quickly once Cascade Point procs. If you want to pair that with triple tap, you definitely could as well. Uh, I think this will just depend on how fast you're able to proc Cascade Point and then how quickly you're able to keep Cascade Point up. Uh, assuming you have bullets in the magazine and you don't need to reload. So there's definitely options there. I think both of those perks have roles that you could you could keep hold on to until we find out how machine guns are going to fare next season. Uh, as for in an ARC 3.0 uh, build, I think we've got some options. You've got Demo AJ. That's the personal role that I'm chasing. That's going to be great for grenade builds. You will be proccing Demolicious and you will be getting those stacks of Adrenaline Junkie even without using your grenade uh, this is going to be a fantastic add to clear weapon. So that's a, certainly a strong role. There is Volt Shot, though, and I think that's what a lot of people are really wondering. Can I use Volt Shot on a machine gun? Can I use Volt Shot on a weapon? It's a really terrible reload speed stat because we do need a reload to get Volt Shot. Now, you do have Compulsive Reloader, right? That will help you as long as you don't go below the 70% of your magazine, right? That's a 50 reload speed and a duration scaler of 0.95. That will be helpful, right? 50 reload speed will take us up to 74 reload speed. I actually think Rapid Hit is probably going to be better here. Remember, Demolitionist does not work with full shots. It needs to be a manual reload, so uh, it, it, that's off the equation entirely. Rapid hit, though, at five stacks, right, if we're hitting those precision hits, that's 25 stability and then a 60 reload speed, so that gets us up to 84 reload speed, and then we do also have on top of that that 0.93 multiplier, so I, I think that's probably the best option. You know, compulsive can be helpful as long as you don't go below, uh, you know, 70% of your magazine, but if you do want to use all that mag up on on jolting enemies, getting those uh, true ad clear potentials up. I think Rabbit Hit's probably the better pairing with Volt Shot. Uh, Dragonfly, it doesn't really line up with a lot of, uh, you know, we don't have reloading perks in Calm 4, so even though it's a really strong option, I don't want to leave this gun at that base reload speed, right? Even if I did get some really solid reload options, if I got Light Mag or Flared Magwell and a reload speed masterwork, I still don't think it's worth it just to say uh, I've got a double damage perk machine gun of like Dragonfly or AJ or Dragonfly High Impact Reserves. You could pair it with Wellspring if you want to do some ability energy. Uh, if you've got another way, say an ability, if you're on Hunter and you've got a, a dodge that you can get your reload back faster, or if you're on Titan and you've got a rally barricade, maybe. But for right now, I just 
I just don't think Dragonfly and Calm 3 on this gun in particular is going to do it for me. That reload speed stat is just too slow. Um, I could slay out, but then I'd be stuck with having to reload my weapon afterwards, and that could be problematic. So, yeah, overall, a lot of really exciting roles. I mean, I, I think at this point in time, you're either on board the machine gun train or you're not. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I can do much more to convince you to get on the machine guns. I think they're quite strong. I love them, uh, especially as a warlock who typically gets assigned divinity. That's kind of been the weapon that I use to get myself special ammo for divinity when I'm doing a raid. And I swap over to Div, and I'm using that during the actual boss damage fights. So, you know, I do think there are places for machine guns. They can be quite strong. We did get champion mods for them last season, so they're now in the rotation for that as well. Uh, I think there's a place for them, but if you're not into it, then nothing I've said so far will probably convince you. But if you are on board, we've got some great options here at Terminus Horizon, and I do think this is the best arc machine gun that we currently have in the game. That is legendary. Thunderlord's still top tier, and I'm not trying to take away from that beast of a machine. But that is it for our legendary weapons in the dungeon. We do have one more, the the special exotic that is coming with the bow, uh, coming with the dungeon. Court, what can you tell us about this bow? Yeah, this is Hierarchy of Needs. It is a exotic solar, uh, and it's uh, kind of under the hood. It's considered a lightweight bow. Uh, it doesn't have lightweight. Uh, 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 bonuses though uh, so fully drawn precision hits and kills charge up guidance ring counter uh, so requires 6 charges to activate uh, precision hits provide 1 charge in PvE 2 in PvP kills provide 1 charge in PvE 2 in PvP and precision kills provides 2 charges or 4 in PvP uh, so once you're at that 6 charges Hip firing with a full draw while guidance ring is uh, is fully charged creates a guidance ring for twelve seconds. Uh, interestingly, this interacts with war mine cells. I know we're not using war mine cells in the current sandbox, but if you destroy a war mine cell on the same shot that creates a guidance ring, it increases the guidance ring size by two hundred percent. So quite substantial size here. Uh, and so the whole gimmick is you're using this guidance ring, uh, which will show up in the, the in world as this just literally a, a ring. Think of um, uh, Do Doctor Strange uh, when he casts the the the, the sort of portal. Uh, it's kind of in the same manner of this. Uh, you, you don't have a, a vision through into another dimension or anything like that, uh, but uh, it is a uh, just literally a, a circle that you will be shooting through. So arrows fired through a guidance ring that are at least mid-drawn releases two seeking projectiles which do increase damage the farther it has travelled. Uh, allies with the exotic can share guidance rings. Uh, doesn't fire projectiles without hierarchy of needs. I it only interacts with this bow and no other weapons, but there has been a few bugs. Uh, we were talking about Wish Ender off the, uh, before we started recording here, where there is a little bit of an interesting combination here. Uh, of course, it's Wish Ender that breaks it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the Seeking Projectiles do count ex as explosive damage, so you can pair that with Explosive Wellmaker. Uh, the War Mine Cells that create, uh, are, sorry, are created from explosive damage kills. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the Catalyst, which drops from the Master Spire completion, grants a 0.5 times draw time multiplier, multiplier scalar, uh, i.e. that's 50% faster, uh, and increases reload speed after deploying a Guidance Ring uh, or scoring a hit with a Seeking Projectile. Uh, visually, it's a very striking uh, <laughs> exotic uh, bow, and if you put that on your back in the tower, uh, it's twice the size as your garden, <laughs> guardian. <laughs> yeah, there ain't nothing lightweight about this bug. No, okay. big boy. Right. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. think of a stealth bomber. It's very much kind of uh, uh, I think the designs after uh, those stealth bombers looks visually uh, edgy and uh, something you probably wouldn't find on, on radar. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's interesting exotic. Uh, I last night I just completed the uh, Master Spire completion, and I did get uh, just took fifty minutes or so to complete the Catalyst, and it's a lot better with the Catalyst with the 
the draw time multiplier because it does take a while. The charge, uh, not sorry, not charge time, but the the draw time is pretty slow, even considered this is a lightweight bow. Uh, so it takes a while to kind of get get your uh, uh, draw your arrow and uh, and fire from there. But uh, what are you guys thinking about hierarchy? I know obviously M tissue did get it to, to drop. <laughs> Imagine uh, having the exotic. In <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't fired it yet, so uh, don't have a don't have a lot of comments. I have the catalyst. I have the bow. Don't haven't used it yet. So after uh, after we finish recording, I'll, I'll start using it. And, but um, yeah, it seems interesting. I mean, again, this is one of our another one of our mini game exotics. So you gotta gotta play a little little go through a little quest to uh, to get it all fully up and running, but. Um, definitely seems like it's putting out some good damage. I've seen some people do some damage tests already with it. Um, again, this is a it's a primary weapon, so it's it definitely uh, definitely seems like it's kind of punching above its weight here once you get it up and going. But you know, are, are we going to use it say over outbreak perfected in, in real in game situations? Uh, that remains to be seen. Wishender, of course, now hitting quite strong. I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I'll need to play with it more before I can. So I should say that I actually. Uh... I did get to play test this weapon for, you know, maybe an hour uh, just off cuff at one point when I was working on contract at Bungie. And I did like the flow of like, I'm going through a lost sector and I kind of get into a big open room. I mm. put down my guidance ring and you just start shredding people up, you know, uh, and and to your exact point, Impetus, it, it did give me kind of a uh, outbreak perfected. I'm like, this is the only thing that's coming close, right, to a, to a primary that can put out that kind of a damage, right? So, uh, fun to use. Would really love to use it again someday, maybe. You know, <laughs> who knows? Oh, he's not better. Soon, at all. my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's yeah, it's very interesting. I I would like to bring it into a um, uh, GM this season. Um, we do have a uh, piercing bowstring mm-hmm. uh, as a champion mod, and we do have plenty of GMs this is, this season that are uh, that have barrier champions. So I, w- I would like to bring this in and just see how it feels in a grandmaster environment, uh, and and kind of see how my feedback kind of spins from there. But uh, yeah, interesting exotic. Um, if Outbreak Perfected and Tiku's Divination had a baby, this is what this would be. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. I'm a big Tiku's guy. I love using Tiku's yeah. in uh, GMs and stuff just because it has like such such high uptime and such high consistent like bursts of damage, right? On uh all, like clearing out groups of ads is just a great weapon. So I think this probably will be a And if Warmind cells get buffed, I mean this could be this is a pretty it clearly has built in interactions, so Mm-hmm. Don't don't call it a comeback, you know. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers uh, crossed, all right. baby. Yeah. Uh, Any, anything else to add on the dungeon? Short and sweet. Some okay. We got some pretty uh, below average weapons, uh, but majority of them are pretty great. Uh, very root and tootin' as uh, <laughs> to wrap back to the uh, the start of this uh, section. Uh, the whole cowboy. Uh, vibe um long arm welder flight terminus horizon definitely three weapons i'm very interested in chasing uh for for pve worth the wait for the text foundry yeah yeah it's cool and I, I, that's another thing i was you're talking about uh welder flight earlier uh if you are going for any kind of like damage dealing role um, that text mechanic trait is like is made for uh, breach GL because like who's aiming down sights on their breach GL? Uh, if so, I think you know something I don't know. I don't <laughs> <to> talk, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think that that combo is just like absolutely perfect, right? Um, yeah, really, really fun set of weapons and a fun activity too. I mean, it re- we yeah. we were kind of harsh on the master yeah. mode, but like it's it is a fun activity. It's really no, yeah, really dungeon fun itself is solid all right that is all we have for episode 46 aspire of the watcher special thank you for listening to another episode of pve as always we want to thank our audio engineer autodidactos aka formerly known as mr sudden for helping us sound our best every episode my name is sink beer you can find me by that name on uh, twitter and youtube impetus where can our listeners find you 
My name is Impetus. You can find me on Discord and Destiny by that name and on Twitter as Impetus Always. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Court, where can we find you? Yep, you can find me over on Twitter as at Court Projects and over on the Massive Breakdowns Discord server as Court. You can find my documentation and other science documentation applications to enhance your Destiny experience over on the Massive Breakdowns website. All right, guys, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.